So this morning we're going to be talking about the power of God and how his power can work in a Christian's life and how his power can come into a life of a person who's not a Christian and make him a Christian. And uh, it seems very simple to me that in the New Testament, we see that Christ is very interested in changing people's behavior. He really wants us to love one another. And that particular command and task is beyond every single Christian. It's not possible for Christians to love one another without the power of God. And we're coming to the end of the book of Ephesians. And we've come to the point where he is telling us that we have a spiritual battle ahead of us. That we have spiritual warfare that we're going to have to participate in. When we become a Christian, the devil doesn't like it. And he will, in the first place, uh, attempt to stop us from being a Christian by blinding our eyes from the gospel or prevent the gospel from ever coming into our hearing, into our sight. And if we do get saved, then the battle's on. And we do have a battle. And I believe that the closer we get to the end times, the, the battle intensifies. And so it is. So in this whole section about the armor of God, in Ephesians chapter 6, in verse 10, he said, finally... This is the end of my book, and this is the last thing I'm talking about. This is the last subject we're going to discuss. He says, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. I'm really excited to hear about that. Be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. He gives me a command to be strong in him because I'm pretty weak. But he's strong. And he wants us to trust in him. He gives us a command to do. He's telling us, you need to be strong. You're going to need me. And you'll find out. (laughs) And so we do. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, we thank you for your word and your truth. And we pray that your Holy Spirit will impress these things upon our hearts. Give us that confidence and boldness and Uh, utter reliance upon you, the creator of heavens and earth, the almighty God. We commit ourselves in this time to you. In the name of Jesus, your blessed, precious son, amen. So we're told to be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. Not our power, it's not our strength, it's his. And who is this Jesus that... Uh, where to put our trust in. What kind of power does he have? Well, in John 1, 3, it says, all things were made through him. You know, in John 1, Genesis 1, 1, we read that God, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Well, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit were all making the heaven and earth. Uh, John 1, 10, it says the world was made through him. In Colossians 1.16, for by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. That's something that the people of the world would be serve them well if they would learn that, that everything is made for him. Everything belongs to him. All the air that we breathe, this planet we walk on, the stars that he just put up into space like that, they all belong to him. You know, at one point the Bible says, the cattle on a thousand hills belongs to him. Well, (laughs) the whole planet, the whole universe, there isn't anything that doesn't belong to him. In Hebrews 1, 2, but in these last days, he has spoken to us, in his, by his Son, whom he appointed the heir of all things, through whom he created the world. Jesus is very powerful. When he was here in his body on earth, he told the 
wind and the waves what to do. When the wind starts blowing around here, I tell it to do something, but it never, never does what I tell it. When I used to kayak on Lake Tahoe and the wind would really get blown and the waves would really get big and and then it would come to the point where they were breaking into the boat and my boat started filling up with water and I, I did a lot of praying. God, you stilled the water on Lake Galilee. Can you do that on Lake Tahoe? And I never did sink. Sometimes when I land on the beach, I got out, lost my balance and tipped over and looked very embarrassed. Uh, but today, in talking about the power of God, it's a special day for me because 55, can you believe that? 55 years ago, on October 9th, 2000, or 1967, I trusted Christ as my Savior. Uh, the first time I heard the gospel message, God just spoke to my heart that this is true and it's what I needed. And he changed me. I just want to say a little bit about how he changed me. Because this is what he wants to use his power to do, to change people. And at 12 years old, my dad left because my mom and dad didn't get along. And uh, from that point on, uh, my life, until I got saved at age 18, just really went downhill very quickly. And when I walked uh, to the corner house of Paul Berglund and knocked on the door and asked if Paul can come out and play like I'd done my whole life up until that point. And his mom said, no, he can't play with you anymore because your parents are divorced and you're a divorced kid, so I don't want my son around you anymore. And I still remember that all, all these years later. Yeah, it did affect me. And I started hanging out with the bad kids, started doing bad things. And within a year or so, um, after being so truant from school, I didn't want to go to school. Or I didn't want to be around people anymore. And uh, I used to hide when the people from the school would come and knock on my door. And uh, they would call me in and say, you know, what's wrong? And try to figure me out. And I didn't know. I just didn't want to go to school anymore. So in the sixth grade, they said, well, if you do well in the seventh grade, we'll pass you in the sixth grade because I didn't pass the sixth grade. And then in the seventh grade, they said, well, if you do well in the seventh grade, uh, we'll pass you or do well in the eighth grade, we'll pass you in the seventh grade. And in the eighth grade, they said, well, if we're going to send you to high school, but if you do well, then we'll pass you for the sixth and the seventh and the eighth grade. And by the time I got to my sophomore year in high school, when I went up to the high school, the first day of school, and uh, got out of the car, and, and the dean was waiting for me, Dean Lindsay. And the whole school was waiting for me. They wanted to see me come to school and what was going to happen because I came to school and my hair was too long. And he said, you can't go to school today because your hair is too long. And so he drove me over to Barbara Joe's and paid for my haircut and sat there while I got my hair cut. And then he drove me back to school. And, and we had a pretty good relationship. Um, you know, we were friends. I, I knew, remember his name. I don't remember hardly any of my teacher's names, but I remember him. I remember the the principal's name, Ada L. Peck, from my uh, elementary school days because I was in her office so much. I knew her better than I knew my school teachers. Uh, I was a wreck. And um, all the teachers and, and my mother's friends and everybody was saying, you're just breaking your mother's heart. She's tired of getting calls from the, from the police saying, we have arrested your son again. Would you please come down and get him? out of juvenile hall. And I, I could, I never wanted to do the wrong thing. I just always did. And um, I, I would drink and we would have parties. And, uh, th and then around a freshman or sophomore in high school, I started smoking dope and going to San Francisco and North Beach. And they, they weren't hippies then. They were beatniks, uh, bohemian beatniks, and uh, hanging around in those places. And all the kids in high school thought I was, you know, crazy, and, and I guess I was. 
And then by the time I graduated, well, I never did graduate from high school. My senior year, they just said, you're not 18 yet, but just would you please not come back? We're not going to go after you anymore. Just, you know, we'd rather not have you here. One time I remember I, I fell asleep in one of the classes and with my head on the desk and one of the kids, I wasn't asleep yet. And one of the kids said to the teacher, Mitch is asleep. You know, you want me to wake him up? She, no, don't wake him up. Just, just leave him sleep, you know. So they, they said, don't come back. So I, I didn't. And then um, I totally got Im immersed in the hippie movement and would just stay at home and smoke dope and play my drums all day long. And then after school, the, the high school kids would come over and hang out at my house and smoke dope and listen to me play the drums. And, um, and then uh, one time I moved up into the hills of Northern California and lived in a hippie Communion, we were building a cabin up there, and then winter was coming, and we didn't have our cabin built, so uh, we were going to go stay the winter with another person up uh, in, still in the Sierra Nevadas that lived in an actual house. And up there, uh, I brought uh, some of my drums up there, and I bought a whole lot of drugs up there, and um, took some LSD, some Osley Purple LSD, and it was a tablet splittable into four trips, a little teeny tablet, and you cut it in four. And they would give pe four people um, a, a very wild trip. Well, I cut it in half, and I took the bigger half and gave the smaller half to my friend. And I thought I had gone to hell that night. And I thought I was in hell because of my sin, because of all the grief that I put my mother through. I thought it must be a commandment of God that I've broken. And um, I, the only commandment that I could think of was that honor your father and mother. And one day my mother, she used to tell me this all the time, one day it's going to be too late. You keep hanging around with those kids and doing this stuff, it'll be too late and you'll never be able to come back. And I thought that's it. Now I'm in hell forever and I can never come back. And I was terrified that night. And uh, I spent the night up there. Then the next day I came back home to Sacramento, and um, to my shame, I had four girlfriends at the time, and one of my girlfriends uh, worked for a family, a, a living housekeeper, and they went to a church, and she said, man, my boyfriend is so terrified of dying and, uh, and going to hell, and they said, our pastor can talk to him, so they called the pastor up, and he said, a hippie? And they said, yeah. And he said, well, I'm, you know, maybe in a couple of weeks, I'm very busy. And I, you know, uh, they said, no, you go see him now. You go see him. And he said, no, I really can't. You know, I said, maybe I can move it up another week. And they said, go see him today. And she called me up and she said, my pastor would like to talk to you. Uh, my, you know, the family's pastor wasn't her pastor. And I said, well, I've never talked to a pastor before. I've never had anything to do with church. All I know is that I'm sick and tired of my life. And I'm terrified now of going to hell. So uh, he came over and he met me at the door. And I was barefoot with my long hair and skinny little body. And I had cuts and bruises all over me from that LSD trip. And he looked at me and he told me later, he just said, this is a waste of time. And he brought me over to the church in his little Volvo, and uh, told, and I told him, he says, you thought you were in hell, what was it like? And I described it, and, and what I went through that night, and he says, you know, the Bible tells what you're saying, and that's the way the Bible describes it. And so uh, he said, do you think you're a sinner? <laughs> and, and I said, do we, you know, yeah, I, I'm a terrible sinner. And I, I'm a terrified that I'm going to go to hell. And he said, let me tell you what God says about all this. So he told me that Jesus Christ had died for my sin and that I wouldn't have to go to hell. He also said that, that God's spirit would come in and he would make me into a new person and that I wouldn't have to obey the sinful nature he talked about anymore. And he said, God will give you a new heart. And I said, that's what I've been craving. That's what I need. And he said, would you like to trust Christ as your Savior now? And I said, yes. And later on, he said he was more shocked than... 
So I said, yes. And then he said, well, you know, tomorrow night we have a Wednesday night meeting. And would you like to come to that? And I said, sure. So I walked in this little bitty church, maybe 40, 50 people there with my uh, hippie appearance. And they just taught me like I was one of their best friends. And but that day I went home to my hippie friends and I said, I found the answer to life we've been looking for, you know. And what is it? Oh, it's Jesus Christ. Oh, well, that, that's for you. But, uh, you know, that's that's not our deal. So it's not our bag. So you go um, go on your way. And they never would talk to me anymore because every time I talked to them, I said, you really need Jesus Christ. I'll tell you about hell. It's a really bad place. and You don't want to go there. But if you want to know the God that made everything, I was so happy to know him. And I, and I had a Bible and I just read it every day and I marked it. At one point, when I was about 13 or so years old, I was declared a ward of the court of the state of California, and I was declared incorrigible. That means a person that is not changeable because he's had such a life of crime and misbehaving. And that was me. I was in juvenile hall, I think, five times. Um, Christ changed me, and it was by his power that he did. And within a year of being saved, I was off to Canada to go to Prairie Bible Institute. And, and then I got married and went up there and, and had two kids there and found out they, they only cost $5. You know, so after the first one, I took, had another one. So, you know, two kids, $10. What a deal is that? The state paid for everything, the province of Alberta. And uh, then I went to college and I graduated from that with a Bible major and a Greek minor. And then I went to seminary and f- almost finished the whole thing. And um, came and, and pastored a church in uh, Sacramento, associate pastor. Then I went to Stockton and pastored a new church. And it lasted about a year and a half. And I ended up getting a divorce, leaving the church in shame, and spent the next uh, almost 30 years uh, just wandering and 26 years of living in Lake Tahoe, working in casinos. And I thought my life was, was I'd wasted it. I'd blown it all because of my sinful nature. And one day I said, God, is there any hope for me? And once again, here I am saying this. And God said, yeah, there is. And I said, you do anything you want to me. Anything you want, would you please deliver me from my sin, my habits that are destroying me, that have been with me my whole life. Please deliver me from these things. And he did. And I stand here before you today because the power of God changes people's hearts. And his word tells Christians to love one another. And it's the power of God that enables us to do that. It's the power of God that enables us to do everything that he asks a Christian to do. And he asks us to do some pretty impossible things. But I thank God for now 55 years of um, always being faithful to me, always holding me in his hand. And I'm a testimony to the grace of God that's giving somebody the salvation of his dear son, which I do not deserve. That's his grace. So this morning, we're going to look at the power of God and how powerful it is. And I'll tell you this, it's not doing a bunch of miracles that some churches in this world are looking for. They want to see people healed, they want to see people raised from the dead, and they, they actually talk about these things happening all the time. When the truth is, one of the greatest uh, in the faith healing world, one of the greatest churches for this whole movement is in Redding, California, and when the the virus came along, the COVID thing, there was a big sign on the highway going to their church that said, healing room closed due to COVID. When God's power works in a person's life, it isn't great healings and miracles that everybody can see. It isn't, what it is, is I have learned to love that person, that other Christian before I could not stand that person. Or, I was so self-centered and obnoxious, none of the others believe, uh, believers liked me, and I kept having to go from church to church because once they get to find out how self-centered I am. But then, 
Finally, God's power works in a person's life, and it changes the person. That's what in the, the epistles of Paul, he keeps saying, I'm going to tell you again, love one another. You read, the, read what John says in 1st, 2nd, 3rd John, love one another. And that means put up with one another. <laughs> and we can only do that by the power of God. But we want to look at five different areas. God's power in creation, God's power in these three words in uh, Ephesians 6.10, and then God's power in witnessing, God's power in walking and living this life, and God's power in my life. And the thing is, is that God requires things of us. His power can do anything in our lives. Everything that he asks us to do, his power can do it. Um, in the written word, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Uh, in the beginning, he said, let there be light, and there was light. He speaks something, and all of the molecules and atoms that are necessary for that, they come into being. They're made out of nothing. He makes them. When he said, let the earth have all of the grass and the trees and vegetation grow. When he spoke that, it happened all over the world. The whole uh, means of a plant staying alive with the sun and the leaves and all, all the little parts of a flower and the photosynthesis that's necessary. Uh, a seed being in the ground when it gets to a certain temperature for a certain amount of time with certain amount of humidity all of a sudden it decides to pop up because God told it to and they will forever do that and apple trees always have apples and peach trees have peaches and um, they got green grapes and black grapes and red grapes and uh, and when they take the seeds out of them they're all really really good uh, everything that God makes is good and, and he just said it and it happened that's the power of God. When he made a place for human beings, and it's, this is the only place in the universe. And I, I heard again the other day, oh, they found a little speck that might be a speck of water on Mars. Well, human beings need water. So he put us on a planet, and what is it made mostly of? Water, because we need it. Why do people including me, love to go to the beach or to the river or to the lake. We like being around water. What are we made mostly of? Water. God knows what we need. He, we need to breathe air, so he gave us a whole lot of it. The whole planet has air. It, it's an atmosphere. It's all around it. The higher you get, the less there is, and finally it goes away. But where we live, we got air. We got water. We got gravity. It's a good thing because we're going really fast. The earth is like spinning around really fast. The whole thing goes around every 24 hours. And then the whole thing is moving around the sun every year, and it's going really fast. But gravity keeps here, and we don't even know it until you get drunk, and then everything, say, oh, my goodness, we're spinning. God is the almighty God. He's so powerful. And it talks about him... He, he makes stars. And evolution says that the way stars are made is, is that two stars come together and then they'll make another star. So inquiring minds want to say, well, how did the first two stars get made if it takes two stars to come together? And the evolutionists don't know because their, their uh, theory is wrong. <laughs> The Bible says that God made the stars. In Genesis 1, verse 16, he said he, he made all the, the sun and the moon and all of the stars up. And he just says, oh, and the stars. Oh, and the stars. I, I forget how many, how many earths can go inside of our sun, but it's a lot. Stars are very big. And when you look up at the sky at night, there's just these beautiful little twinkling lights. And if we were close to one of them, well, we wouldn't get very close before we burned up. They're enormous in size. And not only that, those little lights are light years away. Millions of light years. Light travels at 186,000 feet a second. And in one year, 
of traveling 186,000 miles a second is one light year. Well, they are millions of light years away. So when we look, we just see these little twinkling pretty lights. In Psalm 8.3, uh, the psalmist says, When I look at your heavens and the work of your fingers, God made the stars with his fingers. And I want to know how he didn't get burned because they're really hot. He made them with his fingers. And it says that he set them all in place. When I was little, we used to sleep out in our backyard in the summertime at night, you know, tent and all that stuff. And we had a little campfire and we would cook our breakfast in the morning. But uh, when I went to sleep, you knew where the Big Dipper was. And when I, if I would wake up, you know, we didn't have watches and clocks and stuff. We were outside. And uh, you would look for the Big Dipper to see where it was. And where it was, say, oh, it's all the way over here. It must be almost daylight by now. You could always tell that. He made the Big Dipper. He put all the stars in place. And he did that 6,000 years ago, and they're still there. And you can still look at it and, and tell what time of night it is. In Psalm 19.1, he says, The heavens declare the glory of God. The sky above proclaims all his handiwork. This is like his handiwork. He made all the stars with his fingers. He's v incredibly powerful. And, and then he asks us to do something in our lives, and we just say, God, I can't. I, you know, I'm, I hear this from the kids a lot. I'll ask them, I say, you need to change in doing that. And they say, I can't. And I say, you have to. You can do this. And they say, no, I can't. Well, if somebody so powerful as that living inside of you, then you really can. And in Romans chapter 1, this describes the people of all ages, but especially today, because today we have science. And science, there is only one real true science, and it's on the Democrat side. They have real science, but we don't. We just have fake science or no science. Well, here's what God says about science. In Romans chapter 1, verse 18. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men, who by their unrighteousness, they suppress the truth. They don't want to face the truth. They suppress it. And we actually see that today. People that tell the truth on social media are banned. For what can be known about God is plain to them. Because God has shown it to them. What is he showing? What is so plain? Look out the window. Walk out the door. Everything you see is plainly seen. For his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power, his divine nature, they have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that, they have, that have been made. So, they are Without excuse, when they stand before God at the great white throne judgment and they say, well, my science professor taught me that, there, that you didn't exist. They're not going to say that when they're standing before God. They'll say it now. They don't have any excuse, though, because they're denying the truth. For although they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him. But they became futile in their thinking and their foolish hearts were darkened. The foolish said in his heart, there is no God. Claiming to be wise, they became fools. What do our educational systems of today, they all claim to be so wise, and we're so dumb. They exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man and birds and animals and creeping things. Therefore, God gave them up says, okay, I've had it with you people. Carry on the way you want and face the consequences. They deny the power of God that created this heavens and earth. And when you sit at the beach on a day that's like in the 60s, a little bit of coolish in the air, and the sun is 
93 million miles away. And by the time its heat arrives on my face, I say it's just right. Just perfect. And I feel nice and warm. Not hot, but just perfect. And they deny that. That happened by accident? Come on. <laughs> no, it didn't. The written work, word, the record that we have in the Bible declares the power of God. And we need to have a written record because no one was there when he did it. The angels were created somehow before when the heavens and the earth were created. The angels watched God fill up the earth with the animals and the plants and the fish and the birds and human beings. And it says in Job that they applauded and they cheered when they would watch God make things. A beautiful scene of the angels singing praises to God when he made this earth. They see the power of God. And we do too. We see the power of God. And then in Bible prophecy. This is the only religious book in the world that has Bible prophecy. Did you know that? The Quran and all the writings of Buddha and on and on and on. They don't have Bible prophecy. Why? Because they're not written by God. God is the one that knows everything. In John 13, 19, Jesus said this. I'm telling you this now before it takes place so that when it does take place, you may believe that I am he. Then the Greek, it just says that I, I am. That's what Moses was told God is at the burning bush. You may believe that I am because only God can see the future and predict the future. In John 14, 29, it says the same thing, but it says that you may believe. Same thing. In the book of Daniel, it talked about the, the present uh, nation that ruled the whole world, Babylon. And then it predicted and told that the medial Persia uh, nation would come along and defeat Babylon and then rule the world. And then that Greece would come along and defeat medial Persia. And that the Rome would come along and defeat Greece. It, it spoke all that ahead of time. And it all came exactly as God said. Because he's God and he knows everything. Not only that, he plans everything out. He, plan he said that someday there'll be a one world government and you won't be able to buy or sell anything if you don't belong to it. One man will rule the whole world. Isn't that interesting that globalists now are talking about globalism? We have a global world and it's all tied together and we need a global leader to handle the whole thing. And it's going to be very bad. It, in the name of saving and helping the world, it will destroy the world. But God's going to make a new heavens and a new earth. And just as all of his other prophecies in the past came true, the prophecies in the future are going to come true as well. It says in Isaiah 46.10, sums all this power of creation up. For I am God, and there is no other. I am God, and there is none like me. Declaring the end from the beginning, from ancient times, things not yet done, saying, My counsel shall stand, and I will accomplish all my purpose. And so far, he's 100%. I would believe everything else he said is coming. It will be 100%. Someday there will be a new heavens and a new earth where we will all live happily ever after and we will worship God himself in that throne, in that city, New Jerusalem. So Bible prophecy declares the power of God. He's the only one that knows. And then God's power in this verse, Ephesians chapter 6, he mentions three powerful words. One of them is uh, Dunamai, we get the word dynamic and dynamo from it. It says in Ephesians 3.20, Now him who was able to do great things in your life, him who is able, that's the word, he is capable of changing us and helping us live, giving us the strength that we need. 
Uh, this word is also used in Acts 9.22. It says, Saul, after he was saved, became very powerful. He became more and more powerful. And his power was seen in explaining that the promised Messiah of the Old Testament was indeed the Jesus they had just put to death. He proved that to them. And they were uh, confounded. The Jews were. They just, wow, this guy is powerful. And then in Romans 4.20, uh, Abraham was promised by God that he would have a son and that a lot of uh, people would come from that one son, as many as the sand on the seashore and the stars in the heavens. But he didn't see any son. And he finally got to the point where he was 100 years old. And he thought, I'm too old to have a son. And his wife who was barren anyway, she was now too old and too barren. But it says that he grew strong in his faith. And he did that by the power of God. He did believe that. And to this day, we have the Jewish people. To this day, our Messiah, Jesus, is the one we rely upon for our salvation. He grew strong in his faith. And then Philippians 4.13, I can do all things through him who strengthens me. He strengthens us in everything we need. And he can, we can do all things. A wonderful promise. In 1 Timothy 1.12, I thank God, I thank Christ Jesus our Lord who has given me strength. That's what Paul said. God gives me strength. He had strength to minister. You think of the great apostle Paul, the only reason he was great was because of the strength that God gave him. He utilized that strength. He didn't waste it or ignore it. And then in uh, 2 Timothy 2.1, You then, my son, he tells Timothy, be strong in the grace that it is in Christ Jesus, uh, commanding him. And then in 2 Timothy 4.17, Paul went to trial, and all of his friends didn't show up. They forsook him, he said. But he said, the Lord stood by my side and the Lord gave me strength. Thank God. So that's that uh, first word, strength, that means to be endued, clothed with the strength of God. That's what we're told to do. And then uh, in the strength of the Lord, this, uh, another Greek word in, in Luke one fifty one, when Mary was going to have the baby Jesus and she was told by the angel that she would give birth and she says to the angel, but I'm a virgin, I can't have a baby and I'm uh, engaged, but we're not married yet. How is this going to happen? And, the, whole, and uh, the angel says, the Holy Spirit will overshadow you. The power of the Most High will come upon you. And she said, okay, I'm good with that. And, and then she went on and wrote a song and says, He has performed mighty deeds with his arm. And then Ephesians 1, 19 through 23, uh, Paul is praying that we would know how much strength and power we have. We need to know how much strength and power we have. Verse 19 of chapter 1. He wants us to know the immeasurable greatness of his power toward us who believe. How big is his power, is his greatness? It's immeasurable. You can't measure it. And, and where does his power go? It goes to us. It's toward us, the ones who believe. And it's according to the working of his great might. Every time he talks about all these strength words, he just puts one word next to another. A one word for strength, another word for strength, another word for strength. You get the idea. He says, I want you to understand that power of God is in you and can do incredible things. This power that's in us is the same power that worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at the right hand of him in the heavenly places, far above all rule and authority, and every name that is named, in this age and the age to come. 
He put all things under his feet and gave him uh, as head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. That's all done by the power of God. And he says, believer, all of that power is in you to do what God asks you to do. The strength of God. In Colossians, there's a similar prayer. Uh, and being strengthened with all power according to God's glorious might. When you think of God making stars by his power, that power's in us. And God keeps getting praised by all power be to you forever and ever. And then that word might is just used 10 times. But um, in 1 Peter 4.11, it says, If anyone serves, he's serving God, he's serving in the ministry, he should do it with the strength that God provides. Because if you don't, you won't be able to do it. We need to do it with the strength that God provides. And in Revelation 7.12 uh, and power and strength be to our God forever and ever. In Jeremiah uh, 10, 12, it is he who made the earth by his power. All that available to us. And then the third point is God's power in witnessing. In Acts chapter 1, verse 8, it said, you will receive power after the Holy Spirit comes upon you and you will be my witnesses. So how does that work? In chapter 4, um, they talk about God's mighty creation and the power of God being the creator. The apostles were told, you can't witness, you can't speak in Jesus' name anymore. The Jewish leaders forbid them to speak in Ju Jesus' name anymore. And they said, well, we got to speak in his name because he told us to. So we're going to do it. You are people and he is God. We have to obey God rather than people. And then they went and prayed to God and said, God, you're the creator. You have all power. Would you please give us more boldness? They told us we can't talk in your name. Give us more boldness. And so God did. And they went out and spoke in boldness. And more people got saved. And at that point, they, they prayed in this great prayer to God for boldness. And the ground shook. The building shook where they were. God was telling them, my power is available. In uh, Acts chapter 5, they go rejoicing. They, they were glad that they could suffer for being bold and preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. Even... Uh, persecution didn't stop them from doing what God had commanded because it was the Holy Spirit in them that gave them power to do this. In Acts chapter 8, there's a man, an Ethiopian eunuch, reading in Isaiah, and he doesn't understand what he's reading. And that one person being saved is so important to God, he sends Philip there, and Philip goes and says, what are you reading? Well, I'm reading from Isaiah, where... Um, somebody, and I don't know who it is, but he's bearing our sins. All of our sins are cast upon him. Who is this? So Philip goes on the chariot and sits with him and tells him, well, this is Christ that was just crucified in Jerusalem. And he was the one that was talked about there. The Ethiopian eunuch gets saved and then he's baptized. And it says that Philip got beamed up. God just took him by his power and put him somewhere else and said, now witness over here. All by the power of God. God knew somebody needed the gospel and Philip didn't know, but God brought him there. It's all the power of God. And then Paul and Silas, after being thrown in jail, were singing. And uh, all the prisoners heard it, the guards heard it, and there was a huge earthquake and all the doors opened and all the prisoners, prisoner guard head of that prison thought, oh my goodness, I'm going to be put to death. Everybody escaped. And Paul said, no, we haven't. And right away, this guy says, what do I have to do to be saved? I want what you guys have. And they shared the gospel. Believe that Jesus is your Savior and you will be saved. And so he did and his whole family. 
And then when Paul was in this sh- on that ship going to Rome, and it took months and months and months uh, on several different ships, but they were finally on the one that was going to shipwreck, and they were all going to die, and they threw everything overboard. The wind was so strong that the ship was being blown, and they couldn't stop it. But an angel appeared to Paul that night, and the angel of the Lord says, everybody on the ship will be saved if you do what I say. And the ship will be lost. But And all of his cargo, they already dunked all the cargo, and he says the people will be saved. And he told the people, I was taught by an angel of my God, whom I serve, that we will be saved. We just cannot leave the ship. Stay on the ship until we crash on the rocks, grab a hold of whatever you can, make it to shore. And they did. And every single person was saved because he trusted in the power of God. He was convinced that God would do what he said. And it came true. So the power of God in witnessing, and he was a witness to the guards, to the people on Malta where he landed, and then he went off to Rome to be a witness to people there. And then, uh, fourthly, God's power in walking, in living. Uh, A very important verse to know is Galatians chapter 5, verse 16. In Galatians 5, uh, verse 16, it says that we are to walk by the Spirit, by the power of the Spirit. We are to live by the power of the Spirit. And when we do that, We will not carry out the desires of our flesh. We will absolutely not be able. That's two knots in a row. (laughs) You will not not be able. In English, one knot cancels out the other. In Greek, one knot strengthens the other. And it means that if you walk by the power of the Spirit, when the desires of the flesh pop up, you do not have to obey them and you won't obey them. If you don't want to walk by the power of the Spirit, then you will end up obeying them, even if you're a believer. But I guess this is a point that really needs to come across very strongly, very forcefully. God said, all the power in me that is the creator of heavens and earth, if you trust in my power when temptation comes, when your flesh wants something for itself, when your mind starts lusting or looking at something it shouldn't, and you're thinking of thoughts you shouldn't, and, and you've had struggles with this all your life maybe, that if you trust in God's power, you don't have to give in to those things anymore. I gave in to things that, that I thought I would never ever be able to stop doing. I was convinced I would never be able to stop doing them. Until I said, God, you are powerful enough to stop me from doing it. I don't know how you will stop me, but I know that you are powerful enough to do it. I want to live by the power of your spirit. And God did. I trusted in the power of his spirit, and I trusted it every day, all day long. God can do things in us that we never thought could be done. We know ourselves. We know what goes on inside of our heads. And God is able to change those things to make us live how he wants us to live. I am forever plagued by my past, by all the things that I've done. When I go to Sacramento, I go through my old neighborhood. And I could tell you, I did this there, I ruined this there, I got in a fight here, I, I was drunk here. And, and Satan just uses that to say, you really should not be in the ministry. Or I can drive through Lake Tahoe, drive by liquor stores, drive by where I used to live, and Satan says, you really shouldn't be in the ministry. Look what you did. And I can say, but the power of God worked in Jesus Christ to die on the cross and forgive me of all my sin, all of it. It's all forgiven. And his grace, I don't deserve it. You're right, I don't deserve it. But you give it to me, and I'm going to take it, and I'm going to use it. 
So now I have a life where I can stand in front of people and proclaim the word of God. Now I have a whole new set of kids that I can teach the word of God to. And, and my birth set of kids, I, I talk or text to them, I try to often, more often now than ever, and, and proclaiming the word of God to them. And, and my two birth kids were, um, uh, they saw me at my worst. Well, they didn't see me at my worst because I hid in my house and they didn't see anything, thank God. Uh, the things that I find now just utterly repulsive that I participated in. They saw me and I can be around them now and feel like uh, a person, feel like a man of God, feel like I have something to share with them because God has changed me by his power. And we look in Ephesians in Paul's prayer for them. They have the power of God in them. Each one of us have the power of God in them. And why? Because we have the Holy Spirit in us. And that's that. And Paul prays for these Ephesians. You know that he was a pastor here in this church for a few years? That he led these people to the Lord? He taught these people? And that Timothy went and pastored at this church in Ephesus? And what does Paul do? These, these believers... That, that had grown up under the teaching of Paul. In chapter 1, verse 15, he says, I am praying for you people. And then you get down to verse 19, he says, I'm praying that you know the immeasurable greatness of the power of God. I want you to know the power that's inside of you so you can use it to live for him. And... You know, we're told that we only use a small percentage of our brains. Some less than others. <laughs> Sometimes I uh, feel rather stupid and I think I'm just using a little bit. I need to use more. But how much of the Holy Spirit's power are we using? We get used to our sins and the things that we know that God doesn't want us to do. But you know, with this power, it's all there. It's all available for us to do exactly what he wants us to do. And just as his power is there, his mercy is there, his love, his patience that puts up with us. And he, he, he wants us, though, to keep changing, to keep growing, to be more like himself. So in our lives, we can walk and live for God because of his power. In Ephesians chapter 3, verse 20, Paul says, Now to him who is able, and that's this word dunamis, dynamic, dynamo, God is able to do far more abundantly than all we can ask or think according to the power that is at work within us. To him be the glory. You know why? Because it's all about his glory. When there's things in my life that I can't change that I know he requires of me, I can trust in his power that is in me. I can say, God, I know this is something that I just am not good at. And it's something that has plagued me forever. Would you please help me to see your power work? So, God, that's as far as I can think right now, <laughs> as I know facts, <laughs> but I don't see them in my life. God is more than abundant to do far more. This is a place where he adds far more. I can do it all. Whatever you think, I'll go beyond that. <laughs> that's what God does in our lives. He wants us to know his power. Paul is praying this to people that he taught. God, please help them to know how powerful you are inside. Because Paul learned how powerful God was inside. When you honor God and ask and trust in him, he honors that. So um, the truth is, and we'll find out in our business meeting next week, is that this church has not taken in enough money to pay for its month expenses in a few years now. So now we have this ministry of having kids come here. 
And the kids, the parents are having to pay. And some parents said, I can't send my kids there anymore because I can't pay it. Too expensive. So we said, any parent that cannot pay and wants their kids here, the church will take up that amount and pay it for you. Well, how are we going to do that when we don't even take enough money to make our monthly expenses every month, year after year? Because as a church, we decided to trust in God. That God will pay this money. Besides that, there, there is money there. But our savings just goes down. But it, God put it there. So does God bless this? Well, there's only so many kids that are allowed to come here because it's small. And we're already there. And, and now other people are popping up and saying, we want our kids there. We've seen what it does. We want them in that ministry. And, and something we need is a place for these kids to play. So some of the parents, after we said, God, we're trusting you, some of the parents said, we want to put a playground down here and put in sod. How expensive is first-class Kentucky bluegrass sod? Well, that would just be about $1,500. So we said, that if people want to do that work, and I think that's the right thing. Let's do that. And then right away, somebody pops up, and I don't know who. And they said, well, we want to pay that $1,500. Okay. If we wouldn't have trusted in God, we wouldn't have had the $1,500. And then they go to buy the sod, and it's for some kids, and for a kid's playground at a church. And they say, well, we don't want to charge you the $1,600. We want to charge you $800 half. So now the parents <coughs> working on this say, well, that gives us another 800 to put more stuff out there. <coughs> Excuse me. Him who was able to do far more abundantly, exceedingly, beyond. And they've already said, once we get that part, we'll start going down that way. And God keeps providing for that. You trust in God and trust in his power and see what he will do. So, wow. And then who gets the glory? We don't. He does. He gets all the glory because he does everything. Yeah. So the power of God. He commands us, be strong in the Lord and in the power that he has because he has all you need. Be strong in him. And all those impossible things will become possible. Paul says, I really pray that, that you people that I was there and preached to for years, I pray that you'll know more of God's power. So that's God's simple message today. The power of God in my life. He's able. One time... A man says to Jesus, if you're able, could you heal my son? And Jesus says, if I'm able? What do you mean if I'm able? <laughs> of course I'm able. By the way, your son's already healed. <laughs> yeah, he's able. Think of what he's spoken to us this morning about. What can I just I can't give this up or I can't do this and I know he wants me to. He's able. Just keep asking him and he'll be patient. And we need to be also. Yeah. So let's pray together. Father in heaven, we thank you for your power. Thank you that you've given it all to us. And we pray that your ability to change us will be manifested in our lives. Help us, Lord, to obey your truth and be strong in your power and in your might and see that you are the one that is able to do far more than we even thought possible. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.